two, three, four. Hello there, Tony Medley once again and a nice warm welcome back to my workshop. If you can cast your minds back about two weeks ago, um, the video if you wanted to watch it or wanted to see the comments was number 56 and it was a walnut tea light. And I'd ask people what, what people thought of the new camera angle. There was a, a, a massive response and the majority of people were saying that they like to see um, the, the way that I fast forward. However, there was a, a great deal, a great number of people who said um, they wanted to see the presentation of the tool to the piece. Um, they the found that it was, uh, as they were beginners, they found that it would be useful uh, if they could see exactly the angle that I'm putting the chisel to the piece, uh, how I present it on the tool rest. So um, it springs to mind that there's a lot of subscribers, and I must say at this point, thank you very much for subscribing, it is appreciated, that uh, there is a, a great need for a, a couple of videos or a series and I will try to put them into a playlist for beginners uh, that there is a need for uh, videos for, for beginners. So what we will do, I intend to do a series completely for beginners. Now uh, it's up to the more experienced people if they want to just fast forward or move on to uh, the next video that I make. It's entirely up to you. Um, I'm going to go through um, all the different tools that I use, uh, I'm not saying in one video, I'm only going to make a number of videos, short ones, even the, the chuck, the um, ball gouge, quarter inch ball gouge, three eighths ball gouge, half inch ball gouge, uh, skew chisels, scrapers, uh, pattern tools, as well as the new negative rake scrapers, which I find very, very good. So I think the best thing to do is that I will do a number of short videos aimed at the beginner. And we, what we've got to remember is we were all beginners at one time. And if we can help people, then fine, because it, we should be encouraging new people into this wonderful hobby that we have. Uh, it's so rewarding. So, I think the first one that we will do, we will start with uh, different types of uh, different types of chucks, how you change the jaws, or should I say align the jaws, uh, different types of uh, chucking points that you can make. Uh, so, without further ado, we'll get started, and hopefully uh, that we can spread a little bit of knowledge in, and if you can get something out of it then that's absolutely fantastic. Well I'm going to start off with the different types of chuck that I uh, that I use. Uh, this being um, a one for finishing the bottom of balls off, they can just move them. Uh, they've got a little allen key on them, you turn them and you can put them in whichever, you, whichever one you want expand it out and clean the bottom of the ball off which I think is so important as you've heard me say on my videos the most important part or one of the most important parts is getting the bottom done just the same as the top because we spend hours making something and then as soon as somebody picks it up and has a look at the other side they find that it isn't finished off and it turns them straight off so you wouldn't go to a shop and buy um, a, a, a piece of furniture where hasn't been finished off on the bottom so why would you make a ball but anyway that's the uh, expanding jaws and it's uh, it's for uh, physically doing the bottoms of balls another one which I uh, quite often use and this is this one is uh, just a larger version with the bigger jaws uh, and they all have or the ones that I have uh, have dovetail um, jaws so that if you're going from the inside or, or inside or the outside they've got that slight taper on it that you can see 
and I will show you how uh, what I do, what works well for me to fit them in. This is the normal chuck what I normally use and uh, a lot of people don't know that you have to set these up. Uh, it's nothing, it's nothing um, dramatic and all you have to do is just slacken them all off each of the Allen keys. So if you slacken every one off and that allows the jaws themselves just to move and they're only they're only moving slight I don't know whether you can see that but yes I don't know whether you can hear it it's it's starting to move about so what I always do is slacken them probably one full complete turn then all you do to line your jaws up is to tighten it tighten it up can you see how that's moving about now they're all slack and if you just tighten them up with that, they will be out of line. So what I often do is, when I put new jaws on, just tighten them right up. As you can see, they're all nicely lined up. They're nice and flat now. And what I like to do is just make sure that they're all nipped up. And you always do the opposite. So that you tighten them up. So we're at the bottom, we stay at the bottom. Then we'll do the opposite to, to that one. And that should give you nicely aligned jaws. We can now open them up. And another thing which is so important is when these jaws are made in the factory they're made as one then they put on a machine so uh, that they're physically made in that state they have got numbers on them one two three and four and that corresponds with the chuck so you put number four to number four number three to number three and so on but to make something what's going to go in there what we need to do is make sure that we get the optimum grip with these jaws. So, as I say, in the factory, when they're made, they're made as a solid piece. And what they do, they put it on a machine and they cut them into four segments. So, to get this round, if you, what you need, ideally, is a gap of about three millimetres. That is what has been taken out. And I'll just get an uh, electronic pair of cal uh, calipers and we'll just check that, that that is the round part of it. Right, we'll just put the calipers on, hit the centre, and as we turn that round, you can see the gap is exactly the same right the way round. So that is when it's at its optimum grip. Now what I'm going to do just to prove what I'm saying is true, we will open it up. And they, these are going way out of shape. So what, to, to prove that, what I'll do, I'll open it up. And what you do now is close that up. And if you turn that round, can you see you've got a gap of probably three to four millimetres. So what it's actually doing, I'll just get a pen and mark it up here. When you've got it in this position, you've probably only got a little bit there, a little bit there, and it's only gripping on the centre of each jaw. And ideally what you want it to do is grip right the way around. So if you remember, when you are measuring, is to me uh, close it down to three millimeters. And when you've got that three millimeter gap there, that is when the jaws are at their optimum. So if you see there, and if you turn it round, it stays right the way round. And that, when you've got that three millimetres, 
is going to give you grip on all of the jaw like that right the way around I just hope that blue comes off because it's a permanent marker it should do but that's what we're looking at so that it grips right the way around you don't want it gripping just in four four points because that's the chance of it coming off so I'll just try and mark that up that come off if not it'll soon come off I'm sure right that leads me on to two different types of um, the ways that it will clamp on. So what, I, what I've done here, uh, I don't know whether you can see that, but the dovetail, I, I put a dovetail in it purposely so that there's no way it's going to come out. I, I always do put the tailstock up to it. However, it uh, doesn't matter whether I'm using the... Um, the tenon part of it, uh, it's dovetailed, and also if I'm doing a mortise for say the bottom of a bowl, then I do exactly the same. But what you've got to also remember is the two measurements for uh, mortise or tenon joints. So what we're going to do is just measure them off, and what I always do, it's right when I um, Put a spigot on it or a, a, a tenon to fit into the chuck. There's a two, diff, two millimetre difference between the bottom of it, of the joint, and the top. And this one in particular is 48 millimetres at the bottom and it is 50 millimetres at the top. But check because your, your jaws might be completely different. And the same on this one, I'll just check it. It is 64 millimetres from there to there and it is 66 from the bottom part of it and 64 from that from the uh, top part of it what I'm going to do today uh, is show um, the old point of the video is to show you different ways how to uh, mount a piece onto the lathe so uh, I think what we'll do today we will make a worm screw and the first thing that we have to do is to find the center so i have just used one of these Keith Barrows um, center finders which is very good so we've got the center of the piece what I've also got here is a seven millimeter drill and I've put a piece of tape around 20 millimeters uh, so it's just easy so we drill through and we drill to a depth of 20 millimeters so you just put your make sure that it's uh, horizontal and then drill through and that's it it's a little bit off centre but um, I can't help anything now. Uh, we'll soon true it up. So I'm going to put the worm screw on. We're going to true the edges up and then true this uh, back side up. I fitted the worm screw into the chucks of the jaw and all we're going to do is screw it on until it's a nice tight fit. Now that we've got that on, just turn that round Make sure we keep it nice and horizontal and then turn it round, putting a little piece, a little bit of pressure on the back side of it. Uh, now that we've got that in, keep that on and just turn it round. You have to put a bit of pressure on it until it goes nice and tight and up to the chuck jaws itself. That's it. We have it mounted onto the uh, chuck or onto the worm screw and what we're going to do now you need to be cutting uh, just above centre height and what we need to do is get the tool rest in as close as possible and what we're going to do we're going to just true this edge up um, 
the diff I'll just talk a little bit about uh, the, the bowl gouge that I'm going to that I'm going to use. We have two types of grind. We have uh, I like my grind uh, at a 45 degree angle, and that's the angle from the tool to the heel. It's a 45 degree angle, but this one is just a, a, a short grind. Uh, you can see it's very short. It's ideal for hollowing out bowls. On the other end, um, I have what's called a medium swept background. And from the toe to the heel, again, it's 45 degree. It's a 45 degree angle, but it's got much v uh, longer wings. And as long as the scraping edge is uh, a convex, which is round shaped what what it hasn't to be is a uh, concave which is in over because you're only cutting on that tip and that tip and you've got a, a great uh, a far greater chance of getting a catch so what i'm going to do first i'm just going to use the medium grind put it into the tool and what we're going to do uh we're just going to true up this edge so we've got a nice true edge then true this face up and then what we're going to do here is um, make a chucking point so we can get it into the into the um, the lathe itself. So what, what I'm going to do first, and I always say this, I'm just going to bring the tailstock up for added security. It's just a safety feature because uh, at the end of the day uh, we're all responsible for our own safety. Now normally I... Um, 99% of the time I always use uh, an air shield which is a full face um, mask but today I'm just going to use the, the minimum what I ever use is a pair of safety goggles uh, and as I said we're going to enter, oh, sorry, bring up the tail stock and just wind it on, turn it round and it's just for added security we have to take that away when we're putting the, uh, the foot on here to true this edge up but to, to true this edge up here, uh, I'm just going to wear a pair of goggles because I can't use a face mask or anything like that because obviously I wouldn't be able to talk. Right, what I'm going to do, just for demonstration purposes only, I'm going to cut it uh, just to explain the theory of uh, rubbing the bevel. So what we're going to do first, we're going to turn the lathe on and I hope you can hear me and we're going to get it to about 500, 500 that's 590 revolutions we'll probably go a little bit more anyway about 650 sorry that that is it's it's working okay that's at 750 revolutions per minute now when you present the the tool to the tool rest always have the bottom end and um, I'll just turn that round a little bit so you can see it better that that might be better right and what we're going to do what's called rubbing the bevel you're going to put this hand keep that blade away from the uh, revolving uh, piece of wood and you're going to put the slightest bit of pressure on and we're going to rub the bevel now you can see there it's not cutting and what you're going to do is lift with your right hand the stance that you would take is feet apart uh, at a 90 degree angle looking onto the piece and the whole point is not to move your hands it's to move your body and it's to move the weight from the left hand side to the right hand side so that it's nice and comfortable so what we're going to do we're going to just rub that bevel it's not cutting and move with your right hand just move it up very very slightly and you'll see now it's going to start to cut it's getting to the state there you just see the fine shavings and then to the right then weight back over onto your left hand side now the more that you lift with your right hand is the more aggressive cut so you, we've got all the time in the world so just nice and easy and it's starting to throw up if 
like I say, don't move your hands, you move your body itself. And it's over to the left and over to the right. I'm just going to turn the lathe up a little bit more because it, it seems to be it seems to be okay that's up to 900 revolutions we've got the tail stock up there do it again stand in front the bottom of the chisel needs to be tucked into the uh, the top of your hip and we put it on this hand is purely keeping it down move it up and let it rub the bevel it's not cutting Lift it up so it still starts to cut. There we go. Then gently put the weight, transfer the weight from the left to the right, and now I'm going from the right to over the left to the, to the left. Right. That was really the principles of how to rub the bevel. We'll just stop that. We haven't got it trued off, but what, as you can see, this is a really rough piece of wood yet still. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to give you a little bit of explanation about the grain. And I'll just get a pen. Right, what we have in here, we've got the grain running that way, and that's the way that the tree's been grown. It's been cut into, into slabs and then cut into a circle. So what we've got, in effect, is the grain is running that way. Now, if I had a microscope and I looked down on this end grain here, so what you've got is end grain from, say here to here all that part there is all end grain and if i had a microscope and looked down on it what you would what you would see is millions and millions of uh, hollow straws for want of a better word and that's what allows the tree to draw the water up from the ground and it keeps it all moist so you've only got from there to there is side grain and you will get a nice smooth finish which you can feel it there and then rough finish here so the way we get round that is to where we are I was just doing that that stands for uh, cutting purposes only just as a demonstration what we need to do to get to alleviate or uh, get a, a smoother cut uh, on end grain we have to cut the physical ends of the straws. So what we're going to do now, I'll show you how, how, what, how I do it, what works well for me. Just tighten that tailstock up, a little bit of pressure. And what we're going to do now, we're going to go at the same speed, but we're going to physically cut it, but also rub that bevel. Now, any time uh, when you make it, when, when you, you're cutting with a ball gouge or, or whatever, you must rub the bevel. So what we'll do, we will just turn it on. What have I got to do there? Because we've taken that little bit off, we'll just move that to... If, if you get to that stage where you can put the end of your finger in there, it's too far apart. So we want the tool rest as close as we can to the piece. Just turn it before you turn it on to make sure it's not catching anywhere. And what we're going to do now, we're cutting again, or we're turning at about 900 revolutions per minute. And what we're going to do now, we're going to cut it at probably a 45 degree angle, and we're going to rub the bevel and make a cut, and hopefully you'll see the difference when you, you're going to put it at the right angle, You can see the chisel, the, the chisel itself is starting to, it's called chatter. And as I was said, that you're rubbing the bevel at all times, 
Now we'll just go halfway across and hopefully you will see the difference between my first cut and that cut. Now even though that is end grain, I'm sure, I'll just move that in a bit, hopefully you can see the difference between the two of them. This is nice and smooth because we've cut it and this one is rough. Now because it, it's uneven, what you could do first is <clears throat> scrape it first. And the way that we do that is cut on this edge itself. And when I said about it has to be convexed, it means that it's that shape, like rounded, so that you're cutting on that edge there. Just to true it up, and then we'll make a, a cut. So what you do then is, as I say, you keep the pressure on this side here, and you're gonna scrape that off, just to get it nice, nice and even and trued up. Don't lift the, the chisel too, too high because the more you lift it, the more aggressive cut you're going to get. So, just like I say, nice and nice and gentle. And then once once that running nice and through, we'll be able to make a cut and make it as smooth as possible. Right. So what we're going to do now, I'll just stop that, and you can see that, as I said, this is end grain, and you can, you, I don't know whether you can hear that, it's rough, and then you've got the side grain, which is there, it is reasonably smooth, but what we're going to do now is make a cut across it, and you'll see that all of that will be nice and smooth. Right, so we'll turn the lathe on. And what we'll do now is we will make a cut, we, uh, a cutting pass or a, a finishing pass, whatever you were to call it. So nice and smooth, rubbing the bevel, feet about 20 inches apart. You can see I'm getting nice straight shavings from it and you're physically making a cut. We'll just do another one. What I forgot to say there was, when you're doing a cut, uh, a cut you, uh, you, you want this bevel, or sorry, this, this wing, at about 10 o'clock if you're going that way. If you're going on that side, you want it about two o'clock. If you take it at one o'clock, you are given a, a more aggressive cut, so you want it, I would say, about two o'clock. And what we'll do, we'll, we'll cut it that way. So, feet about 20 inches apart again, about two o'clock where the where the uh, the float is is pointing at two o'clock the bottom of the um, chisel is pushed into into your um, top of your hip and we're going to go nice and gentle start to make the cut there nice and smooth you can see the nice fine shavings coming up it I would say we're cutting about two millimetres off, nice and gentle, but what's most important is rubbing that bevel right the way through. So we're going to turn the lathe off and we're going to see what type of... I just wish that you could feel that. That is obviously nice and smooth because it's, it, it's end grain, but this, you know, even though... Because we've cut it, uh, it's a lot smoother than what we would get on a, on a, on a cut. Oh, sorry, on a scrape. So that's nice and smooth. It's physically ready for sanding now. So what we're going to do now, we're just going to true this edge up because what we're going to do now, it's not far out. If you just put your, hold your finger there, you can see that there's a gap. Then it's going to touch a gap and a touch. So the, the blank itself is just slightly broad, but We'll, we'll soon true that up. 
what I'm going to do now is just slacken it off, turn that round, and as I keep seeing, we want to cut just above centre height, which that's the centre, and we're going to be a couple of millimetres above that, or a, a millimetre. Now, we're going to do what's called a pull cut, and we, we're going to cut it on uh, the bottom edge of the, the flute and we're just going to scrape off until it's nice and true. Still about 800, it's 860 revolutions. Pre press it on, keep the tool away until you, till you, till the last minute and all you're going to do is pull this, this is about 45 degree angle. You don't want to be cutting on that edge there, you want it about in the in, right in the in the centre. So pr pressure on with your left hand, nice and gentle. And what it's doing is cutting, not cutting, cutting, not cutting right the way through because it's not it's not exactly true up. Now, hopefully. We'll just turn that off and have a, a quick look. Right, you can see I've cut this part to there and then it isn't because, the, 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 you know, it, it's just out of true. So I haven't cut anything there. Then, so what I'm effectively doing, I'm, I'm cutting, then turning fresh air, then cutting again when it's touching. So we'll take another couple of scrapings off that and then as I said before, not this edge here, we want to be cutting in the middle and your tools must be always sharp. So there we go, nice and gentle. Take another part off. You will get the experience, or you will know from experience, when you are cutting right the way around. There's no chatter on the on the there. Just trying to get a bit of chatter. Can you see how it's going? So once more, rub through. That is much better. Even though, yes, it is. It's um, it's rippled sycamore. But so what we're going to do now is we're going to we're going to make a chucking point.